Course 9, Class 10. So, if you are following along in the readings, this course, this class is titled A Description of the Medium and Lesser Scopes. Can you hear with the fan? Yeah, we can shut it off. I mean, I just, I just feel bad for you to have to speak loud because... Should we turn them Bring them closer so they're not... No, this, no, I think this, this is good. This was no, this one is fine. This one is quiet. Oh, yeah. It's just this, this one. one. It's, it's really quiet. noisy. That one looks louder. Than that one. No, come closer. That one's, that one's flat. That one's too loud. Come closer, <laughs> Yulia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I will, but it's, it, I don't know, does it bother you? It's better now. It's very yeah. loud. Thank you. So, description of medium and lesser scope. So, it's interesting because I promised you two classes ago that we were going through the short lam rim of Jason Kappa, right? And um, we're actually not going to make it all the way through the lam rim. It's a little, it's a little adventurous to, or uh, what do you call it, ambitious to try and do it in the amount of time we have. But you are going to get the um, the full meal deal, so to speak, about the whole path, which is what the Lam Rim is, right? The Lam Rim is both the steps to the path, like the f entire steps to the path to enlightenment, to complete entitlement, uh, entitle entitlement, <laughs> entitlement of enlightenment. I kind of like that. You know, they can, there's a common complaint that, that people feel so entitled, right? But if they were entitled in, the, in a wisdom way, as opposed to an ignorant sort of way, wouldn't that be fantastic? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're shooting for. And um, we did, in the first of these three classes, which are about the Lam Rim, talk about how it starts with the bowing down, right, to the... Buddha, but more importantly to the three jewels which represent basically three forms of how you can look at emptiness, right? Which is really crucial for all practice, uh, but especially if you're going to complete the practice quickly. And we spent a lot of time in this course talking about causes, about karma, and um, that actually is foundational to the um, initial steps. But remember, two class, no, last class, we talked specifically about that important breakdown of the Lam Rim. It, we could break it down into two main parts, right? Joyce, do you remember what it was? Finding your Lama and serving your Lama? You can, that's true, but you could say finding your Lama and everything else. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's how they how you can dissect the Lam Rim. So finding your Lama uh, is, is huge, and we spent almost the entire class last time talking about that. Um, thank you for sending out the Magic of Empty Teachers links. Mm -hmm. I really, really recommend that everybody listen to that at least once, if not repeatedly. Um, as I was preparing for not this class. Actually, I was finding all my notes to get ready for ACI 10, actually. And I, I out of my, my resource bins came um, the Magic of Empty Teachers course that we've taught here, thanks to Holy Lama Marut, based on the Silent Retreat teachings. And, um, and also, mm, what came out was... Um, the most in, in exquisite sort of breakdown of the Lama by Alexander Berzin. I don't know if you guys are familiar with amazing Buddhist scholar and practitioner. And uh, so I, I'm not going to assign Berzin as additional reading, but if you're really struggling with who the Lama is or all of that, I highly recommend going to his writings also. It's all online, just B E R Z I N Alexander Berzin.org, I think, or oh, .com. Is it? Okay, you eat the link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, just really, really, really exquisite stuff. And I found a flyer for a workshop I taught called Practice 108, 
which I did because Mira Sh Holy Mirashani asked me for that. And uh, so that was all about the Lama also. So we've got archives on that somewhere. I don't think we were streaming yet, but I think we've got the recording of it. So if anyone's curious, it's somewhere. <laughs> we can send that to you. Okay, so we spent really um, the proportionate amount of time on the first step, which is finding your Lama. So now we're going to cover everything else okay? <laughs> in the time allotted to us. Actually, I've got more stuff for you today. So um, the, court, the class is titled Description of the Medium and Lesser Scopes, but really what um, you need to understand is, and we've talked about the scopes before or the realms of samsara, like we talked about that a lot in the course previous to this, right? In the Death and Realms of Existence course. And we have talked about the paths to enlightenment many, many times. But this is a really important review to have in the context of the Lam Rim. And remember how we also said the study of Lam Rim is really important to just do every once in a while. If you get any sort of experience at all listening to Holy Gashala teach in person or Lamaji, um, you will find that regard, no matter what it is that they're teaching, they will actually give you a complete Lam Rim at the beginning. Sometimes in the case of Holy Lama Marut's classes, you'll be getting it for three quarters of the class, and then in the last quarter, he'll like give you the whole other course <laughs> that you need. It's quite remarkable how he can do that. But it's that important to understand all the steps, all the scopes, and it's kind of like a you are here map, right? So you guys remember this, right? The, the different realms of samsara, we've got the hell realm, we've, Preta is the hungry ghost realm, we've got the animal, we've got the human, and then I just wrote Deva Demi in kind of one, because sometimes it's divided into um, pleasure beings or gods, and the Sanskrit word for that is Deva. Mm, these are not enlightened gods, these are samsaric gods, but that realm is sometimes divided in two, into semi-pleasure beings or demigods and gods, okay? But regardless of where you are in this, and I kind of drew it, I was gonna draw you little pictures and put it kind of higher to lower, but demigods and gods are not higher in spiritual evolution than humans because they're all, all of this is still in the realm of samsara, okay? And they say that as a human, you're actually the most um, fortunate in your position because you have e just enough pleasure and just enough pain to know you want to get out, right? And how this information, the knowledge of the realms, ties into really, really understanding the paths is that you're not even on the first path of accumulation until you have real renunciation in your heart. Now, sometimes people think, well, maybe I'm just not suffering enough. Like, maybe I don't want out badly enough. If you have any thought that you don't want to be unhappy, you are. You are in that moment. Your mind is in renunciation. So the other thing with all of these realms and all of these um, potential incarnations is what we're talking about is that we've talked about these being different states of being, but you should think it more as different states of mind. Because first of all, it's all a projection coming from you anyways, and the projection to be this or this can happen in as quick as 30 seconds. Your karma shifts, and there you are, right? Um, but also states of mind, I find it really easy to relate to as a human because in any given day, in any given week, you can go from being in such a full-blown rage or blind sense of something that is so this close to an animal realm. Or you can be feeling the most exquisite bliss and having indulging in the most fabulous offerings and you know it can be very godlike right um today actually this whole weekend was it was um an incredibly summery weekend for some people it was 
paradise. For others, it was a hell realm. Same day, right? Some people really love the heat. Others break out in hives or whatever. So it's not, um, it's not about a location, right? It's about your state of mind. It's about where your seeds are ripening. And of course, where are your seeds ripening? Always with you, right? So it's really, really interesting to see how this all ties into the where are you on the map of Lam Rim? Because the Lam Rim is a really beautiful way of checking in with where you are with your practice, checking in with where you are in your um, spiritual evolution. Each step of the Lam Rim, as you'll discover, comes with its own flavor of contemplation or meditation. So if you are having a particularly challenging time with these types of issues, there are contemplations and meditations in the Lam Rim that you can really work on or focus on. Purification was a big one that we've covered over the last little while, right? And um, it can give you the tools to really manage some of these states of mind and really take charge of your karma, of your causes and effects, right? What's the, so it puts the power where it has always been, but we've really been untrained to utilize it. What's really interesting is these are the paths, right? Now the fifth one isn't really the path. The fifth one is no more learning. The fifth one is really full enlightenment. So you're there, but they call it that anyways. This is the critical one, right? Right here, the path of seeing. It's, um, it's that, see, up until here, this can take many, 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 many eons. This, they say, lasts 15 to 20 minutes. Compared to beginningless time, 15 to 20 minutes is nothing, right? And then this, can take, they say sometimes seven lifetimes, depending on the context, sometimes they say 16. They say if you get here and you do nothing else but sit on the sofa and let your karma burn out, it will take you 16 lifetimes. Can I ask a question? Let's say in this life, is it there a possibility we had the, we've seen the direct perception of emptiness in our past lives, but we have forgotten? It's a really good question. And they say that it's not so much that you've forgotten, but you can see emptiness directly, of course, more than once. But the first time is profound. And after that, you are on a completely different trajectory. So if you're still wondering if you have or if you haven't, then the likelihood is you haven't. Having said that, there is um, also on, these, on this trajectory, another thing that is covered in this class are the, um, what they call the three tracks. Do you guys know this? There's, and there's two of them are Hinayana and one is Mahayana. So there is the um, listeners, the self-made Buddhas, and the Bodhisattvas. These two are Hinayana, and this one is Mahayana. They say that, not they say, this track that I'm talking about, well actually, they do say that all three have the same paths in the sense that you have to go from accumulation to preparation to seeing emptiness directly. But this is where it gets a bit tricky because 
you see emptiness directly. It's not like you see a different emptiness if you're on a lower track. It's the same emptiness. So if you have that pivotal, transformative, mystical experience, then um, you, you can't actually fall lower. So it's a really good debate question, and it actually depends on what hat you're wearing to get to, uh, like, depending on which hat you're wearing, you will get to a different answer. What I've been told is that if you see emptiness directly on any of the lower tracks, you automatically go here on the higher track. Because what? A listener Buddha is, you're a Buddha for God's sake, right? Like a Buddha totally without uh, mental afflictions. The definition of a Buddha, like we're not talking here. We're not talking partial gods and full gods in the realm of samsara. You get here, you're out, out completely, and you are a full-blown Buddha, right? But there are different um, ways that's explained, and that's actually the topic of a much different class than what we're on. So suffice it to say, the three tracks are covered in this course. So thank you for jumping to the end of the class. <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> and know that that's what they say. They say that you have to go through all five levels. And they say you can go it at the three. But I'm tossing in that if you see emptiness directly, you, you, you are changed. You are a stream enterer. And it doesn't mean that you would ever not be a stream enterer, OK? But interesting question is even before seeing emptiness directly, when you are on the long rim, you can actually on any of these tracks, basically from beginningless time to somewhere here, you will never ever again fall below the human realm. That's kind of reassuring because we don't know how long we've been at it. We, if, unless you, um, like if you don't know, chances are hasn't happened yet, but you're really, really close, right? So, but if you're beyond this, then you'll never, ever, ever have to be here again, ever. This is the contemplation and the motivation of a lower capacity, a lower scope, right? So we're talking lower, medium, and higher when we talk about the Lam Rim. We're talking about the uh, different states of mind and we're talking about the different motivations. So the lower capacity, the lower scope, always just, they want to um, avoid a bad rebirth, right? For themselves they just really 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 want to be a good human so that they can keep coming back and keep getting their way to here right but um, this is where the whole right you're you're really getting serious about wanting to be out of suffering remember this is where you're really 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 getting an intellectual understanding of emptiness and you're getting really good at meditation so you're doing both of those simultaneously and so this is where all of what you're doing it's the book learning it's the homeworks quizzes and finals it's the debate it's the doing your daily contemplations it's doing your six time book it's doing all of those spiritual exercises to build up your capacity so that you can really excel in the spiritual gym, right? This is what you're doing. So now remember here, these are still in samsara. So if you are doing your practice and you're getting really good at meditation, but then you just get all of a sudden like off in la la land with your meditation, you're not here yet, you're here somewhere. You can end up here, which is going to take you right back somewhere over here, right? This is why the Deva realm can still end you back in a lower rebirth. Because once the karma runs out, right, you still have your pockets of karma, deep karmas of dark karma to burn out before you can actually even Once have you're, burning all your karmas up there, you're using up all, all right, the good and stuff. Then you just come right back yeah. 
Yeah, but you know, that karma will burn out eventually too, and that's why they say it can take 30 countless eons. But if you're somewhere here, you're so close, right? Why take another few eons? That's an awful lot of zeros, right, <laughs> behind the years. So, um, it's a lot of reverts <laughs> in different realms. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't last class, but in one of these audios in this course, there is, um, Geshla does talk about how at some point here, and again, before you reach enlightenment, you will be, you will have a very visceral recollection of um, all of your previous teachings, you know, all of your previous lives. There's a really uh, beautiful, famous story of Machi Glabjong, who's one of the few documented female um, lineage holders in the Tibetan Buddhism. She's, she has the lineage of, it's spelled Chod, C-H-O-D, but it's pronounced Chu. Um, and it's the, it's the practice, it's actually a very musical practice. And it's a physical practice that's done historically on charnel grounds, on graveyards. And uh, actually Geshe-la has taught some of it. You can find it on the knowledge base. And uh, why did I bring her up? Because it's not part of this course. But it's, uh, I guess it's because it's a goddess day. But uh, very, very much practicing the, the view of emptiness and purification and, and really holding your, your karmic um, focus. So the different realms, right? Mm. Just remember that these states of mind are what you're trying to train yourself for so that you don't slip, right? And um, these tracks, by the way, are determined by their spiritual goals. So the... Um, mm, Oh, it's really cute. Geshe-la gives an analogy to uh, computer lingo in defining the, the lesser scopes. And he says that people of lesser capacity are trying to draw a firewall around themselves because, um, yeah, and uh, so that their mind can no longer slip beyond, beyond this line, right? And... Uh, Do you guys see another little um, interconnection here amongst all of this? So amongst the realms and amongst the paths, it's, uh, it has to do with, um, it's not a homework question and it's not expressly laid out in your readings, but Geshe-la does mention it by content. He doesn't actually give you what it's called, but what it's called are the three extraordinary trainings, and you have heard that before. But the extraordinary training of morality and concentration and wisdom, right? And remember that you have to have a foundation of morality, which is what this entire course has been about, in order for your mind to be able to be still so that you can see emptiness directly, right? And that's actually expressly in here also. And uh, so to do with the mindset and the motivation, that's how you tie those teachings in to this, okay? Mm. That's right. right? So it encompasses the lower tracks, right? Because so the lower track, the, the very lowest track, just wants to get out of suffering for themselves. The middle track wants to get out of suffering and reach nirvana for themselves, right? And then the greater vehicle, the higher track, wants to get out of suffering for themselves so that they can get everybody else out. And it's only the third uh, track that has the altruistic that's why it's the bodhisattva track it has and that's what defines a bodhisattva motivation 
right? Is that altruism? Does not mean there are, isn't great compassion. In fact, to be a listener who sees emptiness directly would be phenomenal, right? Yeah. So, um, but it's a different motivation and a different practice that goes with with that. And the reason there's all these different tracks is we're all different, right? And then a different type of teacher or teachings will be the thing that you need if you're on any of these tracks. So that's where that is. Mm. Okay. So the other thing in the the lower uh, track is that the contemplation, like if you're trying to avoid the lower rebirths, right? You would be really, really interested in learning about why you would take a lower rebirth, right? So karma and its consequences would be of really integral interest to you, right? You'd want to figure it out. And also they say death awareness meditation. Those are like crucial things that you're dealing with. Um, but in order to do that, right? Um, Hmm. Sorry, the lowest scope would be um, taking taking on the teachings of refuge, going for refuge. So getting achieving renunciation, and studying the laws laws of karma, and then. Um, hmm. Oh yeah, you know. Gashla does get a little wrathful in here. He says that if you're actually not fed up with with suffering, if you're not motivated, if you're not actually worried about your death and what's going to happen after, that you can't actually call yourself a Buddhist. Because that wouldn't be your motivation. Doesn't mean you're not curious or that you don't want to be a better person, but if you're not actually concerned about those things, if they're not motivating factors. You can read all the Buddhist texts you want, but you're not a Buddhist. So you have to get really serious about your um, you have to be really worried about your mind. Well, you have to really care <laughs> where you're coming, right? And not just decide because it's convenient that you're going to um, believe in randomness in one moment or or blame it all on God the next, right? Like if you are really re living in the realm of cause and effect, it's hard. Well, they're all hard. All three are hard if you 100% live. If you are 100% saying you believe that God rules everything, then God rules everything, including my saying God rules everything, and there is absolutely zero free will, right? Um, and as Lama Marut says, even a devout theist would not think that, you know? Mm, and if it was absolutely random, if everything was completely... Lama Christie is famous for saying this, like, if we have no idea what a purely random world would look like, like, it would mean that you would put your foot down and you would end up in the middle of the ocean, and then as soon as you looked up, you would be a frog, or like, you know what I mean? Like, it would, be, everything would be, and it wouldn't even be that, because what I just said actually is substantial, but there would be no rhyme or reason to anything. Ever. So it would be really, really hard to um, to live in any of those. But, you know, cause and effect, right? It's really, really hard because it's really painful when bad things happen to good people or when it feels like you've planted all the right causes and yet the crap still keeps happening. But remember, Gashla said that if you're here, right? You've seen emptiness directly. You have only done away with two of your 84,000 places. So the world may, or actually, you're here. Somewhere in here you reach nirvana, right? Like way before you get to enlightenment. And at the time that you reach nirvana, you never, ever again have a mental affliction. 
ever, but you may still have deep pockets of stuff that need to ripen. So the world may be chaotic. The it may appear that relationships are falling apart or that your health is deteriorating or whatever, like Arya Nagarjuna, Arya Nagarjuna had his head cut off. That's how he died, you know? But he also predicted it. He also knew it, you know what I mean? It wasn't, when it comes to that level of bodhisattva evolution, you no longer experience things that are as John likes to call it, clasciatic, as clasia inducing You just no longer have the um, seeds for that, right? But it doesn't mean that you're in this perfect la-la land with cherubs feeding you grapes, you know? It's just th things could still appear um, to be they could appear to be some sark to anyone else watching, but you in the middle of all of that would never feel it that way. And you would understand exactly where it's coming from and why. And um, it would just be more fuel for your compassion and for your love and your joy and your equanimity. So. Some of the readings I read is that the Buddha got poisoned. Mm. Oh, when he, I've not heard that story, but there's lots of stories, right? Hmm. There's lots and lots of stories. Who was it? It's in the, it's in the Indian tradition where, was it Shiva? Somebody said, well, if he was so omniscient, then how would he Prevented, he said. There's certain debates. Right, 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 right. Well, there are the 14 questions that Buddha never answered because we do still think of it and, and expect a self existent answer. But they also say that in um, enlightened beings will. Well, I don't know that story, so it'd be lovely if one of you can find it and share it with, with the group. But also remember. He reached Buddhahood in the physical form that he came into earth with as Prince Siddhartha, right? And we all know this has to go sooner or later, but we don't know what he saw. Just because everyone else who had the seeds to see him as a flesh and blood mortal form, that flesh and blood mortal form has a shelf life and must go, but we have no idea what he saw and what beings who were at a very similar level saw, right? Because even at the level of temp level bodhisattva, you can um, communicate and see different stages. If, if you, can, you can actually see you can see beings who you're on a similar level with, okay? So, in a way, it's not different than when Jesus walked on water. Not everybody in the boat saw him walking on water, right? Those who had the seeds to see him did, and those who didn't, didn't. Lord Buddha, it, this is a famous story I do know, had um, a very close student who thought that he was kind of whack and really didn't see anything special about him except there was a bit of a glow about him. But, you know, thought that he was a little difficult and couldn't really quite understand what everybody else was so, you know, besotted over. So, emptiness of even the Buddha, right? Because it's not coming from, right? You got to remember who it's coming from. So, um, oh, but this is really beautiful. The Jason Kappa does talk about he does talk about the bodhisattva motivation, right? Because we are talking about 
Well, actually, it's interesting that he talks about bodhisattva medita- motivation because bodhisattva motivation is actually greater scope, and this class is supposed to be talking about lower and medium scopes, right? But Jason Kappa says something really, really lovely about the mo- motivation to be a bodhisattva and how he compares it to uh, the practice of alchemy. So the practice of alchemy is where you can turn like really rough material like iron, say, into gold, right? You can transform it. And apparently, speaking of Aryanagarjuna, apparently Aryanagarjuna had this ability. He had this, he knew the secrets of alchemy. And apparently he was kicked out of uh, Nalanda Monastery for using alchemy to raise funds for the monastery. And so he had the high motivation of serving the monastery, but he was doing it through magic and trickery, basically. So, uh, but we all know that, you know, it's Aryan Agarjuna, so we don't know what it was from his size, but that's the story Geshe-la tells. Um, but the punchline is that the whole uh, Bodhisattva activity is like being someone who has mastered alchemy because and and the secret ingredient is bodhicitta because if you can harness and master bodhicitta you can absolutely transform yourself and your entire world it's what will make the dross the heaviness the iron of your samsaric world into the gold into the golden room into the gold of paradise right and that's the secret ingredient. So that's kind of a lovely story. It's the al- alchemical elixir that Jason Kappa refers to. Mm. You know, and that actually is really important about bodhisattva motivation. Let me just finish this and then um, you can ask your question, Alvaro. But the same act done without that altruistic thought without at least somewhere in the back of your mind knowing that you're doing it for others or wishing you could do it for others. Um, If you don't have that motivation, then it's just um, a good karma that will wear out. Dirty good karma, right? But if you have it with that motivation, even if that motivation is wimpy, but that motivation is there, it turns that motivation into the elixir that will transform you and that's pretty amazing because you know mm, you can with that one skill you can change your entire world that's the whole teaching right there Alvaro you had a question How would the logic apply in that alchemy mastery or bodhicitta when someone actually dies and then the other person, without judging, was telling me, well, it's, it's just gone, it's for the good of all, and I was including more the people that are staying, the, the suffering of the people that are staying and, the, and what what it um, involves in someone leaving the house and travel thinking she, the person was doing that alchemy you know it is for the good and I was telling her yeah I accept that still there's suffering and we're all in that suffering and there's people suffering so the person was like, whoops. And so how does the logic play in, in all this pan? Which one? Would, would, it, would, would the full emptiness of someone leaving the body, oh, it is beautiful, it is gone, it is for good. That is unavoidable, they're gonna die. But then on the other hand, I was telling the person, I accept that the person is gone. They still left a lot of suffering in the family. 
Right, right. You, you know, not just taking it. Yeah. It's very hours. But again, so. though, it's a good question. It's a really good question to deconstruct for yourself in terms of where you are still holding on to self-existence in any of those components. In the person who died, in the person who is trying to believe that it's all lovely and empty, in the apparent, and I say apparent, suffering of the beings who are left behind. And every, that's not to say that they're not suffering. I mean, the whole thing about The whole thing about our reality, the way it appears to us, is that it functions. So however it's appearing to you is the way it's functioning, but not from its own side. That's the way it's functioning for you. So if you're seeing it as beings in suffering, see, so what I'm saying is you got to take it, you have to take it um, as far as your capacity will go to get to that answer. because. Your question is actually very multi-layered. So to give you a simple answer is not simple at all. And the logic actually lies in, the logic will reveal itself to you depending on what layer you're looking at. Was it last week we were talking about the, the, um, the various layers in the veneer of a, like a Flemish painting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how, um, like if there, there were these famous European paintings, right? I think it was from the 16th century, 16th or 17th century. I so don't remember my art history, but uh, artists like Van Eyck and Vermeer are, they have these exquisite paintings, mostly in egg tempera, um, that to this day art restore restoration experts cannot dissect the formula because these were um, secret recipes right that that these artists um, mastered and but anyways it's not about the secret it's not about that's kind of interesting though isn't it it's not about all of that except to say that these paintings have many 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 layers and um, depending at what level your eye is able to see you will see different things so so too with re so too with the realms and so too with the layers of uh, reality and also Alvaro last week we also talked about the difference between valid and correct perception everything you're describing is a valid perception from the viewpoint of the person perceiving so there is no contradiction that yes there is suffering and yes the person left with pure, pure view or however you want to describe it but um, that doesn't mean that it's correct view until you can absolutely understand the emptiness of it without well and the only way we can do that is if every single person in this room already was an aria then we could have a totally different discussion about that same question that you just gave me but until then we have to um, answer that to the level of our own logic. So again, with the question, it, it sounds to me like you're you're actually asking. For, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a, I hear you as asking, what would I say to someone who's seeing who's who's seeing it one way, and and yet I'm seeing the suffering, and where's the logic in that? Mm -hmm. That's how I heard your question. Okay, so. It does require getting very, very clear with your understanding of emptiness because how anyone else sees it, unless you can read their mind, you will never, ever know. They may tell you they see it a certain way, but you won't know for sure unless you could actually see through their eyes, right? So you have to, um, but if it's the compassion that is concerning you or that the logic isn't sitting right. Like you have to look at what it is that you're wanting to unpack in all of that. So your hand went up because I said something. What was it that I said that I prompted you to ask that question? Well, what you mentioned about 
the alchemy. Okay. So over there, in yes, the, the one thing that I was trying to clarify to the person is that we're gonna die. That right. That's a reality. Right. And it's not only love, but there have to be compassion for that. That being is going to the yes. border. I didn't go that far. Okay. But that being is in a transition. Yeah. And uh, there's. There's some other things here to have compassion for yes. and for, towards okay. helping them get out of that That's suffering. beautiful and that's absolutely no contradiction to what I just said. What I'm curious about is where the alchemy comes in to your question. Are you telling me that this person was practicing alchemy uh, or was... Well, the mastery of the transformation uh -huh. is like a pickup. Yes. It takes the poison yeah. and transforms it into nectar. Right. So here was a clear example. The death of a person, she asked me, how are you doing today? And I told her, oh, thank you for asking, I'm sad. Right. So what happened? No, someone died. Right. So she was well, it's all for good. So she took that poison and transformed it into, into the beauty of the being be okay. unavoidable. Okay. Um, Alro, I love that you remember all the bodhisattva metaphors and analogies, and you are um, understanding correctly what they are, but what you're describing to me is actually a little bit different than what Jason Kappa just said. He's using alchemy as a metaphor for what a bodhisattva does, which is no contradiction. It's exactly what you said. A peacock takes the poison and transforms it. An alchemist takes iron and turns it into gold. It's exactly the same thing. So the question you're asking, though, is actually something else, and we should talk about it after class because it's it's actually departing from this particular but you but do you understand that that what you're saying actually is exactly what I just said that it is that love it's that bodhicitta that a bodhisattva has to get everyone else out of suffering and in order to do that they know they have to get out of suffering first um, that is the transformative component okay but the actual, what you're trying to clarify for yourself is a really good question to bring to the debate ground, which is happening here next Tuesday. <laughs> and uh, it would be a good one to work out, but it is a little bit different from this. You actually, what this is saying, you already got. It is that peacock transformation. It is the transforming of something into something else with the key ingredient being bodhicitta. Okay, mm, the other thing that you want to understand in all of this, have you guys heard of the three spheres? No. Okay. Um, the three spheres is, I believe, brought up in ACI 1 and it's very crucial to understand the three spheres if you're going to dive into tantric studies at all. You have to understand that you, as the subject, the object, whatever it is, and the interaction between the two are all empty. So those are the three spheres, you, the subject, the object, and the interaction. All those three spheres, none, none of those three components have anything self-existent at all. Does not mean they don't exist. Does not mean that they don't function but they only function as the ripening of the, of the cause that was in, it's not even each other, it's, the, it's actually only one-sided. It can only be from the perception of whoever is looking, right? Yeah. That's right. That's right. So, um, it's really important in any of our interactions to constantly remind ourselves 
of the three spheres. And Elro, that's also something to add to the alchemy thing, because however anyone, including yourself, was seeing that situation, um, take it back to the three spheres. Okay? So that's another interesting parallel, uh, not parallel, but concept to weave into all of this. Another one. This is actually a really beautiful way that Geshe-la is giving you the long rim. He's actually basically giving you the subject matter of all the great books of Buddhism by giving you these little nuggets. But the other thing he just, you might even miss this if you listen to the audio after, but he talks about how, um, you know, it's Dharma cocktail party banter, right? Oh, everything is just your projection. It's all, all a result of your karma darling you know we say that a lot right and it's like you don't like it like you don't like what I'm saying clean up your karma right? there's there's that element sometimes in a educated Buddhist and um, the thing is though the thing to remember is that this understanding that things are a projection forced upon you by your karma the projection itself is dependent origination Okay, so get this. This is actually your Mahamudra class in 30 seconds. Emptiness is the absence of something. Dependent origination is the presence of something. What you're actually seeing that you're mistaking for a self-existent thing is the actual thing that you are projecting, right? So the positive thing, everything that is functioning for you in your world, is by definition dependent origination. You can think of it as the positive and negative aspects of a battery, right? The negative, the emptiness, the absence, the potential for the projection to actually project anything is the emptiness. But the flip side of that, the positive side of that, what is actually, actually there, what it is that you're seeing, experiencing, feeling, smelling, touching, whatever, is is the dependent origination it depends on your projections sorry that was that was a whole other course in emptiness there but that's just and he doesn't give you any of all of that stuff all all Geshe-la actually says is that um, the highest school's explanation uh, of dependent origination is that things are because of emptiness things are forced on you by your karma but the fact that you see what it is that is being forced on you you're seeing something you're not actually seeing an absence right so the thing that you're seeing dependent origination and actually emptiness are two ways of describing the same thing but sometimes I find it's actually easier to understand dependent origination because that is what functions for us in our world. It's really, really hard, except intellectually, to keep reminding yourself everything's empty. This person yelling at me is empty. They're still yelling at you, right? But how your respond, how they appear to you, that is your karma ripening forced upon you in that moment, and how you experience it is dependent on your seeds. So the actual thing that's there for you, that could only be possible because of emptiness, is by definition dependent origination. And that's really all we can see, right? Because you can't see emptiness. It's an absence of something. Okay? Okay. So... Back to these paths, because with the long run, you're trying to get out of lower rebirth in the initial stages of the, of, you know, after you've found your teacher and you're learning to serve them, then you're really trying to get your motivation higher, right? You, you, you deal with your motivation of wanting to not have a lower rebirth. You, you rise above that and you get to this motivation of trying to get to nirvana. At that level, um, there's actually two types of nirvana. There's the nirvana with something left over, and there's the nirvana with nothing left over. And the left over is this. It's your samsaric parts. So remember I said that you could actually be 
an Arya? Well, you could actually be an Arhat, which means you've reached Nirvana and still have the world exploding around you, right? That's because you have reached Nirvana with something left over. You still have your samsaric seeds to clear up. You still have your samsaric form to purify. Nirvana with nothing left over is complete and total enlightenment, which is what Lord Buddha displayed. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that he wasn't poisoned. I'm just saying I don't know that story, but many of you seem to have heard it. So I'd love to see hear that story. But regardless, he did what they call withdraw his emanation, his human emanation. That's what they call dying in um, Buddhist literature. They say that so-and-so withdrew their emanation. Um, which is kind of a beautiful way to think about it because withdrawing your emanation and dying, dying seems very final, right? Like one minute you're there and the next minute you're not there at all, you're gone. Whereas withdrawing your emanation means that the appearance that you had ends, but it means that you're just appearing in a different way, right? To whoever can see you. So um, they do that whole nirvana with nothing left over is what Lord Buddha demonstrated when he appeared to die, right? Because you know, he was, it wasn't even nirvana, he was already fully enlightened by this point. So, um, but to be in nirvana with nothing left over, you can't take your physical body with you. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky because we're just talking about nirvana. We're not talking about full-blown enlightenment. Remember that an enlightened being can appear in any shape or form. They can appear in multiple shapes and forms at the same time. They can appear to die in one location and reappear for you in a whole other form. Um, and there's no contradiction. They can appear to you in multiple forms, right? We were talking about in the context of a teacher, but this is the ability of an enlightened being. So what we're talking about here are the two types of nirvana. And remember that nirvana happens way before full-blown enlightenment, okay? That might be a homework question, I'm not sure. So, mm, that's really all that Geshla has to say about the lower realms and the medium scopes because what he really wants to leave you with, with this course, is um, two things. The actual... Hmm. This is where he leaves, he bridges the medium capacity of beings and moves us forward is that you really have to get here, right? To the path of seeing. Because at the path of seeing, not only are you forever changed and you become a stream enterer, but you have four revelations, basically. And these four revelations are what is going to, uh, I will quote Geshla, get your rear end out of samsara. Okay. And he gives a really beautiful uh, description of this that I had never heard before this course actually. All of you have heard about the Four Noble Truths. That's pretty common in Buddhist um, teachings. Geshe prefers to call them the Four Arya Truths and he even would prefer that they weren't called truths. He would prefer that they were called the Four Arya Facts. But even Geshe teaches them as the Arya Truths. 
because it's just such common language. The reason he prefers facts to truths is truth means that there could be something false, right? And when we're talking about these four revelations, we're talking about facts, things that are um, inarguable, things that are so clear when you see them, that it's not about being right or wrong. It's about just being. It just is, basically, and it just becomes so clear. So this is what happens. The four Arya truths, the four noble truths, are the realizations that every being gets after they come out of the third path. What was the third path? Seeing. The path of seeing. So this is where you have your direct perception of emptiness for the first time. And after you come down from that, after you come out of it, you have these, what they call um, subsequent realizations. And the subsequent realizations are just, I've read about the subsequent realizations of various beings, not even necessarily Buddhist, who have all had, and they describe it in exactly the same way. So there's something very um, profound and similar it's a truth and it's a fact, right? Um, I shouldn't even say truth, but it's, it's a fact because even if you're not Buddhist, you will still experience it in this way. So what it is, is how they're normally taught is that life is suffering. There is a cause for suffering. There is an end to suffering. No, suffering can be stopped and there's a cause for the stopping of the suffering. That's usually the way those four are given. My mom was actually like to say um, it's suffering and stopping suffering and the causes for both. But if that's an easy way to remember it. But here's another way that Geshe taught it in this course, which I thought was exquisite. He actually said the second way to teach it, and he didn't make this up. This is another way that it's taught, is through logic, through a linear flow. What would come first, right? Would suffering come first or the causes of suffering come first? causes would come first. So first, understand that there are causes which result in suffering. And then which would come first, the end of suffering or the causes for the end of suffering? The causes, right? So in fact, the way they're taught are, are kind of backwards in a way or mixed up. So um, it's interesting to think about it in a cause and effect form, like which comes first and which comes latter. So if you were to do it in the order in which they would actually occur to you, how you would experience it, you would experience the causes of suffering, which leads to the suffering, and then you would put in place the causes for the end of suffering, and then eventually you would experience the end of suffering, right? So that's um, a less common way that it's taught, but it's kind of an interesting look at it. And then I love my teacher's way, Lamy Vaughan and Lama Rogers say, just remember, suffering, no suffering, causes. There's your four. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's the um, four aria truths. And, oh, by the way, I mentioned dependent origination, right? Wheel of Life Tanka. And I want all of you to beg Sarah Enright to paint us a Wheel of Life Tanka because she went to the Mandala workshop that was here this past weekend. And um, I met her on a break because she and Didi and I had a website meeting. And I asked her to ask the painting master how much he would charge for a commissioned Wheel of Life painting. And she did. And, uh, and I said, but Sarah, I would much prefer it if you painted one for us. You know, like, I don't care how long it takes, but if it's so, ins and she's so inspired to do it, I love it. So she sent me an email today, and I haven't replied back to her yet, but apparently to commission the master to do it would be about $5,000, which is worth it, but we don't have it. You know, it would take us many, many years to... And you can't ask someone to paint something like that without paying, you know, at least half of it up front, right? So, 
but then he kindly offered to maybe refer us to one of his students who could paint it for us. But I have a feeling we're still looking at half that. He didn't say, but you know. Is he a tanka painter? Yeah, he's painter? he's actually the tank he's painted tankas for the Dalai Lama. So um, yeah, and he lives here, and he's a friend of our Tibetan yes, tutor. I spoke to him. So, but Sarah said to me that um, she is she is thinking about like doing one, and I would I think it would just be so amazing if she did. So I am going to ask her, and I think all of you should ask her too. She's also doing Tibetan lessons as contra for teaching the tutor how to use Photoshop. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's really, really, really exquisite. But the wheel of life, the very, very first segment of the wheel is the dependent origination piece. Because it's the, oh, and historically, it's depicted as a blind guy. Because at the level of dependent origination, of how it functions, not understanding the concept of it as being the flip side of emptiness, but it's just how it appears is where we actually think everything is self-existent because that's how it appears, right? It's the appearances of things and that's the first segment of the wheel of life. Mm. Just want to make sure because I've been kind of teaching the course backwards again. <laughs> I just want to make sure I haven't forgotten anything of that. Oh, by the way, when I said the four Arya truths were suffering and its causes, the stopping of suffering and its causes, the causes to stop your suffering is the Lamrim, is the path, is to understand the steps of the path and to walk the steps of the path, to actually take the path. The map's been laid out before you. You don't just go, oh, nice map and put it on your shelf, you actually follow the map, okay? I'll so find the old map. <laughs> one day I'm gonna go here. That's right. It's a really nice map over there, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's right. The secret is then to follow that dart, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm. So just like you could divide the Lam Rim into two parts, finding your teacher and everything else, you can divide the path to enlightenment. You know, we said there's five stages, but you can divide that into two also. You can divide it into the, you can divide it into the first two and everything else, right? Because as soon as you've hit the path of seeing, you're done for all intents and purposes. I mean, you may have some mop up and clean up to do, but you're out of there, right? So that's kind of an interesting way to look at the Lam Rim to the paths. Mm. Like the world with no excuses. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're gonna take a break. It's nine o'clock and I need to get more water. Okay. And this is actually where Geshla took a break too. So let's just stretch, put the fans back on, cool <laughs> off, get some something cold to drink, and then we'll come back and finish up. So we only have about 10 more minutes, but I'm gonna take a break here and then we'll finish up after that. Is uh, Tila gonna take lessons from tomorrow?